Good afternoon and welcome to this month's show. I'm Luke McCormack. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government and industry leaders in data analytics strategies and technologies at the edge. With me on today's show are Ms. Eileen Vidrine, Chief Data Officer, U.S. Air Force. Mr. Sanjay Gupta, Chief Technology Officer, Small Business Administration. Ramesh Manon, Chief Technology Officer, Defense Intelligence Agency. Cameron Sherry, Vice President and Chief Technology Officer, Dell Technologies Federal. Kaladar Varangante, Senior Fellow and Vice President, Office of the Chief Technology Officer at Equinex. And Dr. Melvin Greer, Chief Data Scientist at Intel. Well, this is certainly a timely subject. Uh, there's a lot of data out there being collected. A lot of data being computed needs to be done securely, needs to be done timely. A lot of things to talk about today. Eileen, let's start with you. How are things going at the US Air Force? I can't imagine with all these embedded systems, et cetera, that there's lots of data and technology being analyzed at the edge. Well, I think it's a really exciting time to be at the Department of the Air Force because today we're a department with two military services, both air and space forces, and we're working together to really drive and fuel data innovation. One of the first initiatives that we did when I stood up um, this particular organization was we put together a self-service data platform to empower our airmen and guardians, the capability to do self-service data analytics. And today, that is just growing each and every hour. So any airman or guardian can at the speed of relevancy log on and use data and uh, current state tools to inform their decision-making process from tactical to strategic. It's pretty, it's pretty exciting time. Tools and techniques that are available to, to uh, you know, sort of that end user now, incredible explosion, tectonic shift in capability there. Sanjay, how about at the Small Business Administration? I know there's a whole lot of information that's being pushed out there. Uh, tell us about the state of the state. Yeah, good afternoon, Luke, and thank you for having me back on your show. It's fun to be here. Uh, yes, I mean, data is the, what I call is the digital, the, the currency of the digital world. And why that is important is because increasingly we are leveraging data to drive the decision-making and we're using data in terms of predictive analytics, we're do, using data in terms of prescriptive analytics. Uh, of course, we've always been using data in the sort of the traditional formats of you know, reporting uh, as it's described as descriptive and diagnostic analytics. So uh, at the SBA, we have continued to use all four types of analytics. Uh, clearly we are less in the predictive and prescriptive analytics arena, uh, more in the traditional descriptive and diagnostic analytics arena, but we are certainly seeing an increase going into the predictive and prescriptive side. So for example, um, in the last year and a half, obviously we have had an explosion of data that uh, we at the SBA have had to deal with. Mm. And so we've increasingly been relying on uh, prescriptive and predictive analytics, meaning specifically we're using algorithm-based decision support systems uh, for our trade processing, credit risk monitoring, uh, some of the other loan programs, uh, and being able to leverage data in a more uh, rich and a more holistic manner. And, and certainly this is, I think, a trend that's going to continue to grow uh, from my perspective. The timing is great to, to really enable and unlock that capability for every small business owner out there. Uh, no question about that. Ramesh, how about a defense intelligence agency? I can't imagine the, the, the dearth of data that you are collecting from a variety of resources uh, that, that you're uh, um, giving your, your, your uh, analysts the ability to analyze real time. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as most of you know, we are the foundational military intelligence and our goal is to prevent strategic surprises to the country. And we work across multiple collection methodologies. We work with our partners and allies around the world and the reports we produce go to the Joint Chief of Staff, to the Congress, to our combatant commanders. So data is very important, but more important is the trust and the validity of the data, right? I mean, we need to make sure because the decisions we make from the data is important and we have been doing a fairly good job over many, many decades. <clears throat> Now, what, what we are seeing is we are extending the value of this data 
and integrating that seamlessly into our mission space, both mission planning and mission operations. Uh, so we are starting to look at uh, areas like augmenting human intelligence um, with things like artificial intelligence. So these data will become very important as we start looking at creating future capabilities with AI and other uh, capabilities to move capabilities to the edge. Uh, no question about it, being able to really enhance the richness of that data and do those uh, high-end analytics, super important. And uh, let's face it, uh, when, when, when bad actors are in there trying to get into our environments, they're not trying to do that to look around and see how cool our environments are. They're after the data, right? I mean, that's the, uh, that's the fact of the matter. Cameron, you're in a, uh, a unique situation there where you're, you're able to stripe across all these different environments see it from a, uh, a multi-agency perspective. What are you seeing out there? Yeah, Lute, thank you and good afternoon. And what a, what a great esteemed panel. I tell you, these things are always humbling a bit, Luke. Um, there's a couple of key trends we're seeing that are weaving through this data strategy, data management conversation. Uh, first and foremost, the first theme we're seeing is visualization of data. We're finding, Luke, that in the modern age, it's kind of fascinating, and I know you know this, my friend, from, from running one of the largest civilian agencies out there from a CIO perspective, uh, spreadsheets aren't going to cut it anymore as we move forward, right? Getting data into data cubes and spreadsheets and the synthesis that we uh, used to use of old, we really have to shift into a more visual context. And what I'm seeing is an intersection of data analytics and augmented or extended reality or even virtual reality so that we can actually live and extract the data. To Ramesh's point and Eileen's point, because let me tell you, Air Force has really leaned forward in some brilliant, brilliant ways with their data strategy with Eileen at the helm. But when they look at visualizing the data and you now have data, information, and context to create situational awareness, that's really critical. The second key trend we're seeing is called data streaming or the data stream. You know, we talk a lot about data in different states, and we talk about data at rest, data at motion, and then we talk about the analytic dimensions and predictive or, uh, you know, reactionary types of analytics. What I'm seeing is this data stream philosophy beginning to emerge. And what that is, Luke, is you think of the emergence of like a Google. I can search for what I want, how I want, when I want it begins to bring together these different disparate data sources. And as I continue to refine my search, that data stream is getting more refined against the questions that I'm asking. And for Ramesh and the rest, and Eileen, we know, you know if, you're, if you're looking at an intelligence mission, the key is ask a thousand bad questions to get to that one really good question and answer to find that needle in the haystack and needle, so to speak. Yeah. And then the last thing, the, you know, the last thing we're seeing shape up is this federated nature of data. You know, no longer can we be the vacuum of data around the world. You know, if I talk to my friends at Fort Meade, it's kind of striking. We're rounding out on a yotta byte of storage being uh, being deployed and yotta byte of data being you know provisioned. That is extraordinary when you think that every human being is now carrying almost 3.2 smart devices on the planet, everyone's a data creator. So rethinking what we collect and when we collect it, but leaving data in its current state. And to Ramesh's point and Sanjay's point, it's the sovereignty and integrity of the information. So those are the real three things that we're seeing emerge across all agencies. Uh, great perspective across the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ecosystem there, but uh, you, you dropped Yada Byte on us uh, to the audience. So you're going to have to tell us what, what is Yada Byte for those that might not know. Uh, it is literally the current uh, largest measure unit of storage that we have that exists in the English language. Wow. So think of it as a, a million, over a million petabytes. Wow. It's, and, or exabytes, excuse me. It's, pre it's pretty extraordinary, Luke. It's, it's one of these things. It took a cocktail at the bar in about an hour to really round out exactly to comprehend as a human being just how much data that is. I mean, we're talking, if you were to start building a storage farm, that would be football fields in length, picture building football fields from the East Coast into the Midwest. Wow. That's what we're talking about. A lot of zeros on the end of that. Kaladar, yeah, how, yes, about, sir. 
Absolutely. How about at Equinox? A lot of, lot of data being computed there. You all are right smack in the middle of a lot of different things. I hear Equinox coming up often these days. Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so we are seeing uh, three trends. Uh, let me quickly go over them. Uh, first one is the amount of data getting generated at the edge is increasing. So for example, an aeroplane will generate today around four terabytes of data per plane per day and it's going to go up to 10 terabytes of data. So the historical way of moving data to compute will not scale. Instead, now we have to look at moving compute to where the data resides. So what we're seeing is that now people are basically leveraging uh, container technology and, and they are now packaging algorithms in containers and then they're moving to where the data resides so that they can filter and process and analyze data at the edge. So, so that is what we call as distributed AI. Second key trend we are seeing is what we call as governance of this data. Increasingly, people are finding that even within a big organization, people, as many others have mentioned here, data is the currency or it's a precious jewel. People are reluctant or hesitant to share it, especially raw data with others. So increasingly what's happening, people are finding that I do not have all the data that I need for this to create an AI model in-house. So I have to go either synthetically generate that extra data for training or go to others and actually get data from external sources. So currently they do not exist other than you know, sending spreadsheets and, and emails, a real good way of sharing this data with each other. And that's where the notion of AI marketplaces or data marketplaces we're seeing. That's a second key trend we are seeing. And the third key trend we are seeing is that operational simplicity. What we are finding is that most organizations have few data scientists and they are constantly hounded by various groups like marketing, sales, operations, product, et cetera. These few data scientists have to satisfy the needs of all these different people. And so that model doesn't scale. So instead, what we are looking at is no code or low code AI by which you are giving the data analysis capability, you know, moving that to subject matter experts or making it easy for them or making it easy for data scientists to support many more subject matter experts so that then the entire impedance mismatch between subject matter experts and data scientists is slowly going over time. It's going away and therefore instead of a project taking many, many weeks before you actually resolve that, you can do that almost instantly or within a couple of days. So distributed and federated AI, AI slash data marketplaces, and then low code, no code for operational simplicity are the three main trends we're seeing. You, you raised a good point about the data scientists. I've had numerous conversations with them over the years and uh, uh, their number one complaint is, look, I don't want to take all this time to get to the point where I can simply do the job you asked me to do. So uh, I think that uh, rings true for every data scientist out there, no question about it. Dr. Greer, uh, uh, I, I would imagine that when we start talking about computing at the edge, you know, you got to think about Intel and all the activity that uh, is going on there. Give us the state of the state. Once again, you're in a unique situation there where you're seeing it across the spectrum. What do you see out there? Thank you, Luke. Yes, we are seeing it across the spectrum. And I will tell you that our public sector customers, especially, are hearing the clarion call to take advantage of the data that they are collecting in very, very large environments and driving insight. One of the things that's absolutely um, unique about the public sector, though, is that um, while some people have equated data to oil or to bacon, in public sector and almost all the other domain spaces, data is not that, data is actually people. And so what that is driving is a new focus on what the issues are around the people and the analytics that are being created. You know, we heard people talk about the warfighter and the data scientist and you know, all the other stakeholders. But when we look across all of these domain spaces, there are three things that stand out. The first is that there's an absolute need to think about how to upskill and reskill the workforce. Mm. Without being able to do that, all of these fantastic opportunities that uh, artificial intelligence and data analytics offer just can't be realized. So uh, we have a workforce of talent priority. 
The second is around transparency, ethics, and responsible AI. The trust factor and being able to use either zero trust models or provide transparency around some of the issues that and data analytics provides is paramount. Without it, people are not going to be able to move to meet mission capabilities because they won't trust the environment under which the data analytics operates. And then lastly, while we are seeing a significant focus at moving data um, from the and uh, moving analytics to where the data is, when we look at public sector customers, they are absolutely focused at end-to-end -end solutions, cloud to the edge. They've already developed smart cloud capabilities and now they are looking at edge analytics and edge computing as an adjacency that's going to need to not replace, but augment the environment that they already have. And so solutions are a premium when they are able to operate from cloud to edge. So upskilling of the workforce and data and talent, providing transparency, ethics, and responsible capabilities to this analytic capability for trust, and then creating not just siloed solutions, but end-to-end -end cloud to edge analytic capabilities. Right, and you know, we all think about cloud and we think of sort of the big global clouds, uh, but uh, this emergence of, uh, I'll call them these micro clouds, if you will, these constellation of clouds that are pushed down to the edge, uh, very interesting concept along with, uh, I never heard the concept of uh, uh, data as the new bacon. That's a, that's a new one for me. Uh, definitely heard the oil one, not the bacon one now. Um, Ramesh, let's talk about a specific program that you'd like to highlight uh, where you all are taking uh, data to the edge, analyzing it on the edge, et cetera. I think one of the programs is the public program of record is Mars, which we are working on. It's a machine assisted rapid repository system that's a foundational military intelligence system uh, as we revamp. So one of the goals for us is to make sure data is available to all our consumers, all the J2 combatant commands, Air Force, Army, Navy, intelligence agencies, because we are both Intel and Defense, DOD, right? So we go across Title 10 and 50. <clears throat> and the underlying data fabric, so there is an evolution of platforms, digital platforms are evolving and DODs. Uh, building those capabilities to make sure we are always ready, prepared to support the nation, whatever comes our way. And as we are, as you probably know, we are <clears throat> uh, embracing hybrid multi-cloud strategy. We'll have, we have all the vendors and depending on the mission needs, we will select what makes sense. But for our perspective, we are looking at the data fabric that would make sure we can consume and receive APIs. We will have ability to take a containerized application, deploy it to wherever it needs to go on the edge, whether it's a uh, firefighting drone or whatever it is, right? We, we need to make sure that we can operate in contested environments when signals are jammed. So we have certain mission needs and data is important, but so is the underlying platform and the network and ability to extend those networks to the edge is equally important as we look at these future capabilities. You really do have to have the whole subsystem put together in order to have that uh, type of environment and have a, a primary, a secondary, and a tertiary capability uh, to, to make sure these analytics are available way out there in these remote type environments. And we, we do have it. So just so that you know, we DIA currently offers the top secret network, JVIX, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. The, and that's something that's available to every single combatant command in the world. Fantastic. Well, we're going to take a short break and we'll be right back. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Network. <laughs> 